We're continuing this morning to lay out the vision of the Journey Church. You know, we, we began by looking at the birth of the early church when we first, this is just a couple of weeks ago. Time flies, isn't it? It's very interesting. You know, the old, one thing that I'll tell you, and this is for anybody here that's young, just remember this, the older you get, the faster time goes. Blink. Blink, you get married. Blink, you have kids. Blink, they get married. Blink, they have kids. Blink, you're gone. <laughs> so make the most of it while you can, while we're here. So we're continuing this morning on the vision of the, of the Journey Church. We have a specific vision that we believe God has given to us. And uh, we're only now into our third week of existence but we believe we're going to grow and become an effective tool in the body of Christ in this country. We began by looking at the birth of the early church and how it was impacted by the Apostle Paul's encounter with Jesus as he was on the journey from Jerusalem to Damascus. We're all on a journey. We're on a journey of life and we have, and we all need to have an encounter with God to determine the ultimate destination of our journey. That was the message of the first Sunday. And then last week, we looked at the purpose of the church, how it is ordained and instituted by Christ himself with the express purpose of carrying out or carrying on his ministry here on earth after his uh, crucifixion, resurrection, and then ascension into heaven. Now today, we're getting into some of the nitty gritty. How are we going to do this? What are we called to? And we're beginning to lay out our vision of, as to how we on the journey are going to carry out the commands of Christ himself. So here is our basic understanding of how the church should grow in this day. Now listen to this this morning. This might, you may have never heard about this before, but we believe this is the key for seeing the church grow in this country. We believe that the underlying per principle that empowers and enables the church to grow is the principle of communion. Tuck that away for a moment. That's, what do we mean by communion? What do we mean when we use the term communion? And we go back to scripture and in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16, it says this. We read, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now the, the Greek word, which is translated communion here in this scripture is the Greek word koinonia. And it literally means sharing or a, a fellowship of a very close relationship. You know, if I go into a shop to buy a pair of shoes, what do I do? Do I, do I have any sharing with the, with the person who's going to serve me with the shoes? I have to have some sharing, otherwise I won't get the color, the size, or the, um, or the style that my, life, my wife likes when I get home. So I've got to be very, I've got to make sure that I, I share the truth with that person that's serving me. But do I have, a, could I call that communion? Is it an intimate relationship? And of course the answer to that is no, it's not. There's something, there's something deeper in this word which we call communion. I've got a little grandson of 14 months old. And when my kids were growing up, I was busy. I'd think back and can I think of all the little moments? No, I'm not. But now I'm a grandfather. I have the joy of watching these little, this little baby grow and develop. I never thought I'd be interested. I always used to say to my wife, if we have any, if my 
uh, boys happen to have any grandchildren, I'll only be interested in them once they're about two or three years old and I can start playing with their head. And, uh, but you know what? I've seen this little baby grow and it's the, the developments, the little... I mean, Anthony knows what it's like because we always talk in the office when Jane comes or we're shooting film somewhere, the first thing is... And my, my, my grandson's name's Eddie. Eddie's done this, Eddie's done that. It's amazing how you're interested as a, as a grandparent in the development of your kids, that you, of your grandkids that you never had when your own kids were growing up. I think it's a function of time and a function of maturity. And I find, I find, it, I, I find it's very, very interesting that he is now developing at this age of 14 months the ability to be shy. That's interesting. I've never seen it before in him. And so when he gets, when he gets, he's, he's in somebody's arms and he meets somebody new, he, he snuggles and he snuggles, he doesn't want to say hello. Yeah? And I find that interesting. Why would we, why do we do that? And I suddenly remembered, it's, it's like his Linus. Do you remember the Charlie Brown cartoons? And Linus had his little security blanket he took with him. You know, that was his security. And this is, of course, when he's snuggling in, when the little guy's snuggling into you. It's his Linus. It's his security. He's fe- he, when he finds himself vulnerable, he snuggles in. And I want, to keep a, I want you to keep a picture of that in mind as we talk about communion today. You know, on one hand, you have the, the picture of the little child, which is so open and running around, enjoying relationship with other kids and arms wide open. And on the other hand, when they're vulnerable, snuggling in and feeling safe when they're faced with the unknown. And I think that's the best way of describing the intimacy of communion that when we're vulnerable, we snuggle. Think about that. I, as a reasonably mature man, still, there are still times in my life when I need to snuggle. We all need to snuggle. And that's one of the beautiful things about having a relationship with God because that's when we come and we can snuggle. Over the last couple of years, three or four years, my wife has gone some hundreds of Ks away for a week at a time to care for her aged parents. And when she, when she goes away down south, for the first couple of days, it's great. I come home when I like. I go to bed when I like. I turn the TV on when I like. I watch what I like. I eat what I like. I eat when I like. No one says to me, Terence, the dishwasher's under the bench, not in front of the TV. Or, you know, you take your shoes off at the door. I've just cleaned the floor. Or, here's the keys of my car, I'm out of fuel. First couple of days, I'm free. So much time on my hands. It's great. And then I start missing the voice of correction. I get lonely. I miss the intimacy. You see, we were designed for for relationship. We were designed for intimacy. We were designed for communion. We weren't designed to be all alone. That's why being a a hermit isn't very popular these days. You know, out of a a nation of about four and a half million, five million, how many hermits do you know of? How many people, you know, stay away, away from civilization, just wanting to be on their own? It's not a very popular occupation. We all desire intimacy. It drives us 
to find that other person, that other mate for life. And that, <laughs> that of course, has its problems because we then have to give up something of ourselves to develop that depth of communion and intimacy. We all crave intimacy in our lives. And so this morning, we're going to look quickly at the three communions that are vital in a Christian's life. Three communions. I've probably never heard of this before, but we'll go through them one by one. We're going to share what we're about as a journey church. We see life as being about three communions. The first communion we're all very familiar with. It's part of our, um, it's part of our vocabulary, the, the vocabulary of having relationship with, with God in church. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24 says, the apostle Paul writes, for I have received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the early church was first birthed, it used to get together and have a meal together and eat together. It's one of the interesting things of life that when you have a meal with someone and you eat with someone, it develops a relationship with them. It's part of intimacy that somehow as we, if we eat with someone, we have a, we are a more open to other people when we do this. And so the early church used to get together and what happened in the Corinthian churches is that it got into real problems because of excesses. The, the church was comprised of people who were wealthy and those who were poor. And what happened is this, the wealthy used to bring along their food and used to get into it first and eat it first before the, anybody else could eat it. And so Paul had to write to them and say, hey guys, you need to understand that when you become a Christian, all those social and secular rankings disappear. We're all one in Christ. Paul writes in Galatians. He says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. And by that, not a slave, a servant, or a master. We are all one in Jesus Christ. And that's the interesting thing, is that we all crave relationship. We all crave intimacy. And it's not based upon who we are in this life. It's what we need spiritually within us that God speaks to us. And so the church used to, uh, used to have these had these problems developing in it on this common meal. So Paul then wrote a letter to them and said, guys, this is how you need to have communion. This is how you need to develop intimacy among you. And so he says, there are three things you need to do. Firstly, look back. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And so we have communion every Sunday morning. Why do we do that? Because Paul again writes, he says, do this as often as you meet together. When you come together, do this in remembrance of me. So we do this in remembrance. We'll be having communion after, after the message this morning. And we'll be remembering why we do it. And why do we do it? Simply because we, re, we come and remember that only in God, only in Christ, we talked about this last week on Christos. What Paul writes in Ephesians, he uses this phrase, what it means to be in Christ. When we're in Christ, we come together and together we celebrate our unity. Together we celebrate what Jesus has done for us and dying on the cross, he took away every impediment which we might have of relationship so that we can come and we can have a unique fellowship and relationship with God. That's what the table of God or the table of the Lord speaks to us about. When we take the bread and the wine, the Eucharist, that's what we're, we're saying. The word Eucharist simply means gratefulness or, or we're celebrating with gladness. That's what it really means. 
And so the idea of taking, of taking communion is that we remember, do this, Paul writes, or Jesus said to him, do this in remembrance of me. And we're simply eating each day, or without God in our lives, we're simply eating each day to, to live the next day. But when we know God and we know Jesus, we realize that we now have a purpose in life. We now have a destiny. We now have a, a future. You know, there's an important verse in Titus 2.13. You'll often hear me quote this. And it talks about the, what every Christian's vision of life should be, the ultimate destiny, the destiny at the end of the journey. And it says, it says uh, Titus 2.13, um, forgot the beginning of the first two words of it. Uh, looking for the blessed, uh, I'll get it, it'll come to me. Too, this is what happens when you watch too much rugby. <laughs> Give it to me, someone. It's gone. Uh, looking, looking for our blessed hope, the soon appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's the faith of every Christian, looking under Jesus or looking to Jesus this, or looking for the soon appearing of our Lord Jesus uh, Christ. And that is the, the, the joy that, is set, that sets before us on the journey. When we go through the problems, when we go through the trials, because of our relationship with him, because of our communion with him, we look forward to ultimately with that which he has for us, which of course is his soon appearing, the second coming. Now that of course, this, is, this, is, this fascinates me. I won't get under one, onto this too much, but what really fascinates me is this, is that the whole joy of what it means when we die, when we come to an end of this journey here on earth, what lies before us is so confused in most Christians' minds because that's the, that's the ultimate that we're called to. And yet I believe that the old enemy of our lives has brought so much confusion in about end times that we just ignore it. And yet I believe if we get the truth of it, it's very straightforward. Remember him, remember what Christ has done for us. So do this in remembrance of me. So when we come this morning to have communion, we think of what Christ did upon the cross when he bore everything that I have done that I need to be released from, he bore it on the cross so that I can come in absolute openness of heart and openness of spirit before him. And then the second thing, we, not only do we look back, but we look at the present. It says in verse 28 of that chapter uh, tw uh, 11 of Corinthians, let a man examine himself and so let him eat and drink of the cup. And so in contemplation of our meal with him, not only do we look back, and as, but we bring our lives in the present to him. And there's tremendous power and strength in the communion. Here is Christ who has promised to be with us on every step of our journey. And no matter what the challenges are, no matter what the, what the, uh, the obstacles are, what, no matter what the difficulties we are facing in this week ahead or in the week past, we can bring them to God and give them to Him in the communion. I think it's a wonderful thing. We, when we treat Communion is just a, a simple ritual or rite. We miss the depth of meaning. We, di we miss the intimacy of relationship, which is there for us. And I want to uh, encourage you this morning as you come and later on we'll be taking communion, communion together, that you just reach out, you look back. Let a man examine himself or a woman. Let a man or a woman examine, and so let them eat, so let them drink. Bring it to God first, lay it there. Lay the failings, lay the, the, the obstacles, the problems that you've faced in the past week, bring them to God. And through the trials, through the failures, through the disappointments and the brokenness of the past week, I'm taking this bread and the cup and I'm saying to Christ, hear my struggles, 
hear my challenges I'm facing right now. God, I give them to you. Come and minister to me in them. Why do I do that? 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins, our selfishness in his own body on the cross that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. So in the intimacy of that communion moment, give it all to him. What a great feeling. What a great release. What great healing we can have. Body, soul, and spirit in the communion this morning. So if you've got needs this morning, I want to encourage you in that communion moment just to look to Jesus because he'll meet you right there. So not only do we look back and look at the, and look at the present, we also look forward. Because Paul carries on in that same chapter and he says in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Till he comes. That's our future. We observe communion till he comes. We look to the future. We look to the destination, the final destination of our journey. Whatever the future holds in our lives, we can feel secure because of the cone of his presence. Remember we looked at that last week? The cone of his presence that will never leave us. So life is more than what the Epicureans used to say, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Tomorrow we do die. But it's our intimacy of life that takes any fear of that event away from us. Communion is not a rite or a ritual. It's a moment of intimacy with our maker when we can transact our cares and our anxieties with him. And what a priceless treasure the table of the Lord is. Here's healing for me in every area of my life. So there we have the first communion, communion with God. Then there's a second communion the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about the communion with each other. First Corinthians 12, in the next chapter, it says that there should be no schism in the body, that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And the most, you know, one of the most recurring words or phrases in the New Testament, it occurs 120 times, is the word one another. You see, the body of Christ, the church, is about one another. And that phrase emphasizes that the church is made up of people. And whilst that is the great advantage of the church, it's also it's our Achilles heel. You know, where you have people... Someone has said, you will have problems. What was that Charlie Brown cartoon? The same thing, it said, uh, it's man, uh, what did Charlie Brown say? It's, no, it was Linus, Linus said this. Very important person, Linus. He said, um, I love mankind, it's just people I can't stand. Think about that. Where you have people, you'll have problems. Well, in the journey church, we recognize that challenge. And we have two solutions to that, to that problem. Firstly, scripture. The New Testament is a great manual on how to handle difficult relationships, how to handle intimacy when the wheels fall off. And the New Testament is very prescriptive. It lays down defined rules of engagement. Read about them in a number of places right through the New Testament. And a great place to start is Matthew 18, verse 15, which says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell your neighbor about it. No, it doesn't. Go and tell your pastor about it. No, it doesn't. Go and, go and tell another congregational member about it. No, it doesn't. 
What it says is this, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Interesting that, isn't it? You know, we love gossip. We love it. We, we sometimes think, oh, if only I could. What have you heard? Any news? And it goes on to say, if he hears you, you have gained your brother. And that should always be the first step that we do. We'll talk about this one, one morning. Handling relationships, difficult relationships in the church. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 12 says, There are many members, yet one body. We're all different, and yet we're one body. And that's why when we, we always have an hour after each service when members are able to congregate and meet each other. We want this church to not only be a place where you have communion with God on Sunday morning, but you also have communion with each other, that koinonia. So communion with God, communion with each other. And thirdly, and lastly, there's another communion, a third communion. Communion with God, communion with each other. And the third communion, and this is the one where and I'm talking generically here with a broad brush. This is one where the church has had great difficulty in doing this third communion. You know what it is? It's communion with the lost. Now, last week we talked about the purpose of the church. We talked about the purpose of the church from Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, where Paul in his prayer for the church prays that the church might be the means by which the message of Jesus might be brought to the world. And I guess if there's any failure that we as a body of Christians have failed, it is doing in that we become very insular from the world. We take that scripture, we're, not, we're in the world, but not of the world. And that's true, but it doesn't mean to say we put barriers up or shields up that people, that, uh, people find difficult to communicate or have intimacy with us. In John 20, verse 21, Jesus meets his disciples after the resurrection. He meets them on the beach for breakfast. And he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he says, then wait until you get to Jerusalem and, then, uh, uh, and I'm going to appear, go to Jerusalem, wait there because I'm going to breathe on you there and you're going to really find out what it is to have the Holy Spirit within you. And then he says to them, peace to you as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And we know back from Luke 19, 10, when Jesus was asked the question, what are you here for? He said, the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. So the purpose of the church is to come and seek and save that which is lost. Now it's interesting though. John chapter 20, Jesus says, this is what your purpose is. And a few verses later, Peter, that great apostle, that guy who is hot sometimes and cold the other, he wavers between the two. Does it sound familiar to anybody's spirit here? He says to the other disciples that are with him, ah, I'm going fishing. He was despondent. He saw, probably saw the job that he had to do ahead of himself and he thought, ah, can't hack it. I'm going fishing. I wonder how many of us, when the time when the going gets tough, want to go fishing. The interesting thing is that sort of spirit is contagious, because he ended up another six of them said, "Hey, we're coming with you." And the interesting thing, they put the boat out and they went fishing, and they were expert fishermen. And you know what they caught? 
nothing. And Jesus appears on them on the shore and he calls out to them and say, hey guys, what do you got? How many fish have you got? What sort of food have you got? And they said, nothing. He said, listen, you need to fish on the other side of the boat. What you've been doing is not being effective. You need to change. And I believe that's the message for the church today. When we look back at our own society, we haven't been, the church in the last 50 years in this country has not been effective. And we have a passion to see the, men, the ministry and the message of the church being changed so that we can reach out and touch people who don't have any in intimacy with Christ, intimacy with God, and we want to bring them into that relationship. Cast your net on the right side of the boat. In other words, start fishing where the fish are. That's our challenge. And we've got a few ideas that we believe God has given to us that we're going to use to be able to develop those things so that we might be able to see this nation change. So our strategy in the area is this. We're going to, ha going to have small groups, more of this later on. We're laying out the vision each Sunday is wh what we're going to be doing. Who work as a team. You might be well be saying, well, I haven't got the ability to, be able to talk to people about God straight off. But no, but others in your team will have that ability. And the message we have this morning is we're going to put teams together that can help each other. Some, it was interesting, I had uh, somebody speak to me last week and they said to me, I've got a great ability to, to talk to people but that's all, and introduce them to Jesus, but that's all I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. And I said, great, we'll put somebody with you who can do the shepherding and the discipling, who love to do that. You see, God has gifted each one of us differently. And so we want to put teams together so that it's, you do what you love to do. And I want to ask you the question, what do you love doing this morning? Because what you love doing is that's what God's gifted you at. And so we're going to make it so it's not going to be a hardship or a burden, but something that you're just going to delight to do. That's the simple strategy. More of that next week. But I'm going to leave you this morning with these three things. There are three communions in life that are important. The first one, communion with God. Out of that communion, we have communion with each other. And thirdly, we, out of that first communion with God, he empowers us to reach out and meet others and bring them into that same intimacy and relationship with God. Isn't God good? And so, fasten your seatbelts. We might be small in number at the moment, but listen, if we do this as God has called us to do, this little place is going to explode. That's the vision God's given us to reach out and touch this city, touch this, touch this nation. I'm just going to pray in a moment. For anybody here this morning that has never known what it is to have that intimacy with God. You know, God gives us the ability to better put our faith and trust put our faith and trust in him. That's the most important thing that we can do in life. And so you might not have understood what communion is. You might have just seen it as a ritual of church. But I want to say to you this morning, it's far greater than that. It's something where you can, God comes and he's closer than hands and feet. He dwells right within your heart. So I'm just going to pray this morning, no matter who you are, where you sit, if you pray this little prayer, you can experience exactly that same thing in your own life and spirit. So if you've never had that relationship with God or know that intimacy, 
right now you can experience that. If you've never known what it is to give your life to Christ, I'm gonna give you that opportunity right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just simply, if you've never done it, just pray this prayer. Pray it quiet in your own heart. Say this, sake, Father in heaven, I want to know you this morning. I want to know you in my heart and life. I want to know you closer than hands and feet. Father, I come to you this morning. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he died on the cross to cleanse me and free me from my own failings and baggage I carry in life. God, come into my heart. Change me. Make me a whole new person. Cleanse me now, I ask in Jesus' name. Just keep your heads bowed for a moment longer, just where you sit, just keep your heads bowed. I just wanna pray for you right now. If there's somebody here like that, just where you sit, would you just pray right now? And just give me a little way, just give me a little way and say, yeah, I prayed that prayer. Anybody here this morning? God has spoken to your heart and life. And I'm gonna pray now. I wanna pray for Christians. And you know that intimacy, that deep intimacy that you desire from God. If there's someone here this morning and you've just been, in the, I think there's someone here this morning saying, you've been saying to God, God, I wonder where you are. God, I need to know you in a deeper way. I want where you, where you sit, just stand for a moment because I'm gonna pray for you that God will come and touch your life in a very special way this morning and just touch you and just give you a sense of his presence that you've never had before. If that's you, just, just stand, just stand, just a moment between you and God right now. Bless you. I'm just gonna pray right now. Father, we all stand before you this morning. Each one as big as begging bread. Lord, we need your bread, your life-giving spirit within us. And Father, I pray for each one standing this morning that they might have a fresh touch of your spirit. Lord, just in a very special way, just touch them this morning and let them know deep within, Lord, your love. Lord, pour your love into their lives. Let them know that they are loved by you in a very special way. Father, that you're special to them. Father, that you designed them and made them exactly as they are. Father, just touch them now that what that your spirit might shine out of them to others. I pray that now in Jesus' name. Just touch them and fill them. Let your spirit be upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Bless you, Father. In this time, as we come now towards communion, Father, may we hide those principles right now in our heart, we pray in Jesus' name.